watching The Jenny Lynn Show, and I'm Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And tonight, my guest is James Grobinskus. Correct. I hope I haven't ruined your name, James. Yep, perfect. And James is here to share another great story with us. And I cannot wait for him to begin telling us the reason he's sitting with me here tonight. James, thank you so much for taking the time and coming to my show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Sure. So you saw an, another interview I did with someone regarding near death. Yes. And you wrote to me because you've had three experiences. Correct. Tell us about that. So I had open heart surgery um, in 2010. I had an aneurysm uh, due to a congenital anomaly of my heart valve. And um, the day after my surgery, I flatlined three times in 20 minutes. And that's when I had my near-death experience. Were, were you ever declared clinically dead? Yes. You I were? Was, I was dead for the longest, about two and a half minutes. So there were two to two and a half minutes each episode. I can't wait. Tell me what happened. What happened uh, when you, <laughs> what happened to you? Okay, so, you know, the first thing I remember, so my surgery, I ran into complications uh, from my surgery. It was supposed to be a six-hour surgery, and it ended up being 13 hours. Oh, my God. So I don't remember anything the following day. I was 13 hours of anesthesia, um, but I ran into complications of pneumothorax, um, and because my heart was so swollen from the surgery, my lung pressed up against the heart, and that's what caused me to flatline. And the very first memory I have, and it was very surreal, was I looked up and I was looking around thinking, wow, why are they moving me into a room with such a bright white light? So wait, you could see your own body? So I wasn't floating above my body, but all of a sudden it got bright, really bright. And I thought, wow, they're moving me into a different room. Why are they moving me into this different room? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I would see the nurses, they were talking to me, and I couldn't respond to them. I heard them, I was aware of them, uh, and I knew it was, uh, I didn't know I was flatlining at the time, but I was well aware of what was going on in that room. This is what's so fascinating to me about near death, is you've been declared dead, and your physical body has been declared dead, but your spirit is still alive and seeing what's going on, and aware and in a different dimension, right? Am I correct? Yeah, so consciously I was there. I mean, I knew what was, I, I saw them talking to me, I heard them talking to me. Uh, like I said, I couldn't respond, but no, I was, I was well aware and what was going on that whole time. And like I said, I wasn't aware of the fact that I was, um, died, but I knew they were talking to me. I knew I was in the hospital. I just didn't know why it was so bright. And what do you think the bright light was that you saw? You know, it's an interesting question, right? A lot of people have asked me, oh, did, did you see a bright white light? Were you floating above your body? Um, I don't know yet. What, what if, it continued with what would have happened. Would I have gone to a different passageway? We don't know. I don't know that. Um, but I do know it was definitely a change from where I was at, you know, at that moment. I, I, like I said, I didn't remember anything, and it was very surreal. It was peaceful. It was calm. I was not, you know, scared or nervous or anything like that. Um, Were you scared? Or you said you weren't scared? It, I was not scared at all when it was occurring, at all. You and felt peaceful? Absolutely. I was just curious. Like, wow, it's, <laughs> it was that much of a difference of where I was at to where I went to. But usually when they take you into surgery, they, you're out before you even get into the room. That's correct. How were you able to tell the difference in the light? Or what made you aware that the light was brighter? Well, so this was the following day. So you're right. So before the surgery, I remember getting the IV and, right. I, and I was gone out before they even left that room. Um, so this is the first memory I had from my surgery and it was the following day. And this is probably uh, about 15, 16 hours after my surgery was over. So it's the very first memory that I have post-surgery. And, and that was that. And what happened when they resuscitated me three times, they couldn't do the paddles because open heart surgery, so they had to massage my chest. And when I came to, um, my mom and my sister who were visiting the whole day 
went to grab a bite to eat and their phones went off and they came running back over. Um, they were looking down at me and I looked up and I said, oh, I made it. And I thought I was just out of surgery. And the nurse said, yeah, we almost lost you three times in about 20 minutes. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you died three times in 20 minutes. And that's when my eyes got real big. <laughs> and uh, then I was afraid. I was like, oh, I, I was afraid to fall asleep again, you know? Because um, I was 45 at that time. I did not want to die. And so then that's when I realized, okay, that's what that bright white light was, you know? So have you ever listened to other people's near-death experiences? Yes, I have. And how would you compare yours to theirs? Well, mine is different from a lot of people in that I wasn't floating above my own body looking down, um, but I was consciously aware of you know, what was being said to me and the questions being asked to me. Um, so, so that, I think, was similar because they had, it seems like they were conscious as well, consciously aware. And uh, so I, I would say that was probably the biggest similarity uh, is that conscious awareness. Do you think the reason you didn't see more is because yours was so short? You said Potentially. It was, okay. Potentially. Now, you're a medical professional. You're a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. How has that changed your, your view of medicine, if at all? Well, it's, it's changed it tremendously from um, empathy and compassion. And not that I didn't have that before. But you, it really gives you an appreciation of what people go through. I can really, really relate to fears and anxieties when people come in. And, and so that's the biggest difference for me, is that human experience of being there, um, being on one end of the spectrum going in. I was in a good spot spiritually. I was very calm. I accepted that I needed the surgery, or I would die for sure. Um, and then coming out on the other end of it, totally different than what I expected. I thought I'd be out in three days. I was in there for 13 days. I thought I'd be back in my practice the following week. That didn't happen. So that whole experience, it was a humbling experience of, of health. And up to that point, I was very healthy. People would look at me and they said, wow, you're in great shape. I said, well, that has nothing to do with what goes on inside. So I think the experience of experiencing yes. something completely different than what your expectations were. Yes. And from a human standpoint, the spiritual, the financial, the personal, the, you know, every aspect of your life being affected and stripped down basically to nothing and you having to rebuild from the ground up really gave me an appreciation for health and how to communicate to people about their fears and anxieties that could help calm them. Do you think that's why you were allowed to go through that experience? Because you're treating people. You're a doctor. Yes. So you think that you were put through this experience so that you can adjust your bedside manner with well, people that were coming in to you. Not that I'm saying you needed one. Right. But you clearly have speci specified that it changed the way you interacted with people afterwards. Yeah, I think it, it definitely, I don't know if that was, it certainly helped. I don't know if that was a major reason, but it, it definitely helped with that for sure. Um, and, and part of our profession is connecting with people. So whenever you can enhance that ability, it makes you that much more effective for your patients. So yeah, that was the byproduct of that for them and for me. Um, another one, I think, all unresolved issues in my own life. The reason why I think that, you know, I was allowed to live, God allowed me to live, was, you know, I had gone through a divorce. I was going in the process of that. So I had a lot of things that I hadn't confronted yet. And I, and I feel that was part of the reason for, for my experience as well, is to face death and to tackle it head on. And then now you have time to ponder, reflect on things in your life that you, you know, you live life, it goes by. Sometimes you brush it aside. Now you can't brush it aside. You have to tackle it and face it and, and go through it. So you would, would you say this experience has made you a stronger person and do you fear death now? Or how do you feel about death now? I can say now, uh, uh, I do not fear death. And, and what I feared before 
was death, but more so of how you're going to die. We all want that control. Yes. And I got that powerful message, you don't have a say in how you go. And me being a chiropractor and, and treating people over the years, you see unfortunate things that happen to people, whether it be cancer, neurological diseases, ALS, MS, and you see them suffering and you realize, you know, we all have, oh, we'll live to be old and uh, healthy and, you know, I'll go in my sleep. You know, you have that dream and that image in your that's head. That's my deal. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to my sleep. <laughs> well, and that's what we, that's the ultimate, right? right. To, to have a nice full life and, and to go quietly in the night. Before I need diapers and a, and a pacifier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so and that, that was the, that was powerful. Yes. That's, that, that I had to accept and let go. I don't have control of that. And, and, and that is the fear I had personally was, God, you don't want this disease or that disease after witnessing them with patients because they're just so devastating psychologically to have. Right. And then at the end of the day, I said, oh, I've died three times and I've been there. That and whole I'm, thing, done that. Yeah, I'm on extended play. And that's how yeah, I view it. I right. Like in the old arcade games, you play and you get that extended time. Yes. That's how I view it. I am on extended time, so I am enjoying life um, a lot better. And before I try to enjoy it, but you can't help but enjoy it more. You have a different level of gratitude. And, and, and the doctors told you you had died three different, they, they pronounced you clinically dead three different times yeah. during that surgery. Flatline three different times. Were yeah. you a healthy, would you consider yourself to have been a healthy person prior to that surgery? I was very healthy. So I had probably 7% body fat before the surgery. I was working, out, I've worked out my whole life. I, you know, I've always watched my diet. And when I say health, my definition of health is spiritual, physical, and mental. Yes, me too. So spiritually, I was in a great routine. I would walk before my work in the mornings for two two miles and say my prayers and gratitude. Um, I like that. Yeah, and it helps. I believe in prayer. I've always prayed my whole life. And, and see, and this comes into play here, right, mm -hmm. and, and, this, and the experience that I had. Yes. So, so I was taking care of myself spiritually. I was taking myself physically and mentally as well. So... Um, to, you know, it's due to a congenital anomaly that I didn't know about, nobody knew about, and I was going through a divorce, so I was under stress, and that's when I went to a cardiologist just to check, you know, and he listened to my heart, and he thought he heard something, and then he did an ultrasound, and that's what got the diagnosis rolling as far as what I had, but I didn't know at the time what it would lead to. I was sort of, that's not my specialty, I had no clue, and they, and they don't want to alarm you either. They want you to live life, and they monitor you, but they don't want to tell you too much, because they don't so want people. So when, when they decided you needed the surgery, mm -hmm. did they tell you it was going to be like a little routine well, operation? I knew it wasn't going to be routine. <laughs> you knew but, that. But it was very, it's a complex, uh, anytime you have a uh, bypass, right? Um, so a lot of people are always, confuse it. Oh, you had a heart attack. That's not a heart attack. What they had to do is, is usually with a valve and you have a valve issue, the, you have two choices. Either they put in a uh, pig's valve and that lasts usually nine to 12 years or a mechanical valve and you're on blood thinners the rest of your life. And I was 45 years old. I didn't want to be on blood thinners. So there's a third procedure where they actually take, they keep your own valve if they can. Yes. Repair it, they stitch a primitive third leaflet in. And then they, they put that valve back in your heart and then they cut the weak part of the artery out. Um, and they replace that with Dacron. Right. And then they stitch it all together. So, um, but you know, it's a, it's a common procedure. Right. So I think that's what you're getting at. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, it was a common and the expectation was I would be out in three days. And, and that didn't happen. So, and, and with medicine and with life, there's no guarantees. Um, they can only go on statistics. And, and I was unfortunately one of the two or three percenters that didn't respond. How many years ago was this? That was seven and a half years ago. It was um, end of January, January 28th in 2010. How has it changed you now? It was, it was very, you know, it's the most challenging time of my life. And I think of everything and that God challenged me with, which was a divorce. I lost everything, all my money, I lost my house, I lost my family, my kids. It was split after that. And so, and my business that I worked so hard for. So 
literally to start from ground zero, you know. Um, and, and in my profession, you know, mid-age, you know, not a young kid, not old, but right in that. It, it was a challenge, you know. So you have to rediscover yourself. You know, you can't feel sorry for yourself. It's a process, and you can't cheat that process. And you learn what you're about. So now when you sit here seven years later and look back on that time in your life, do you think it was, are you able to say it really wasn't that bad because this happened, I am a better person? Are you able to say that now? Because you say I lost my home, I lost all my money, I lost my business, I lost everything. And I believe in that saying, when one door closes, it's because a better door is going to open. Would you agree with that when it comes to your particular circumstance with I, that situation? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I do agree with that, but it takes you a while to realize there's another door. You, and, well, and a lot of times <laughs> you can't because I've just gone through something kind of traumatic too. I lost something that meant a lot to me, not a person, right. but something. And everybody kept telling me something better is going to come. And it's very difficult to grasp that right. or to even want to accept that when you don't have any vision or you can't fathom or even foresee what that could be. That's and I'm, right. I would imagine you had some feelings of that, just like I'm losing everything. What am I going to do? Right. My life is over. That's usually how we look at these things. And, and that's a great point. And, and it's definitely in flux right. where you, you go up and down mm -hmm. and sometimes you tackle it better. It's about redirecting the mind. Yes. What questions are you asking yourself? How are you looking at life? Are you looking at everything that you're missing out on? Or are you looking at everything that you've gained by surviving? Right. And so the reality is, as a human, you go up and you go down, right? We all have that, that weakness. We have our fears. We have insecurities. So that was the, the, the silver lining for me, is tackling them and spending a lot of time tackling them, going to counseling. Suffering PTSD is depression, sleep deprivation, and all of that. And so to go through that and to have to grind it out and struggle, and I did struggle quite a bit. And there's definitely good days and bad days now. But overall, where I'm at now, I, I didn't think I could get here that I was you know, seven years ago. And a good example is I just went in recently uh, to get my heart checked and my pacemaker, uh, I have a pacemaker from the surgery because it, it uh, unfortunately messed up my electrical circuit and it was used under 1% of the time and within two years it's now 100% dependent on my pacemaker. So why did that change? I don't know. I think seven years ago I would have not handled that so well. But now I just said okay, they, they have a solution and I accept that and I'm, I'm still alive. So that's an example of getting news that you don't like, accepting it much quicker, and then focusing on other things, realizing that I don't have control of that. Yes, they say life is 10% what happens to you and 90% what you do with it. Yes. And life has taught me that things will happen and it's up to me to choose if I want to fixate and go down or if I want to fixate and just see the positive and believe there is one. Right. And I've chosen that path and I'm a much happier person. I just wish I'd figured it out sooner. But now with everything that you've gone through and the news that you've just gotten, have they given you lots of restrictions in terms of exercises that you can do or is this affecting your lifestyle dramatically? And how is that making you feel if it is? Uh, I am fortunate in that the only restriction I have is from working out uh, with weights, heavy weights. And that's because they repaired the valve and they don't want all that force on that valve. Okay. Um, so outside of that, uh, I'm, I'm free to do as I wish. You know, if I, I'm not a big runner. I walk. So I try to walk three to four miles a day. And, uh, but everything else is good. You know, it's, uh, I, I exercise every day. I stretch every day. And I try to maximize what I have. So. I must ask you this question because I know people watching my show is going to be, why didn't you ask him that? Did you see any spiritual beings? Did you see God or anybody or anything during your, your death experience? Because a lot of people come back and they see people or 
they go through a tunnel and you said you saw the bright white light. Right. I would imagine this is the light they all describe. Apart from that, did you see anything else? Experience, experience anything else? I did experience something that was, was it was pretty trippy, and that was, I felt a dark force, a negative force. Really? Yes, and it was after that experience, and it was, it was, and I don't know what that negative force represented, and what it meant, but it was like an undercurrent. Really? Well, yes. How did that make you feel? Fearful? How did you know it was dark? It, it, that's how I perceived it as, and it did. And, and so I don't know if that was my mind thinking, wow, they're coming to take you. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know. It was, but it was, it, was, it was a weird, to try to explain it, it was just, I felt like a negative energy. And it didn't last that long, but I felt a negative energy body. And when you were experiencing this, because I'm fascinated with this whole phenomenon, and I really believe it. So I've read, like, if you come to my house, I have a whole shelf of books that I probably read every single one that's ever been written. Do you think that, was that, did that coexist with the white light? Or it, were you either in one or the other? It didn't coexist with it. It happened after. And, and so it was What do you mean sense. after, like after you came back? Yes. So I don't know what it means. Well, I can't tell you what it means, but I've read where someone said that they didn't want to come back into their body. They liked being in the light, and they had that negative sensation, that negative experience, and they think it's because they did not want to come back here. They wanted to stay wherever they went and God told them that it was not their time, to, that they had to come back. So I was just wondering if maybe that's why you felt that way. I mean, I don't know. Well, it, one of the, when I did think about it, one of the things I thought, was that and also the, um, in my life, you know, my ex-wife was, that was not a good situation for me. And that represented a lot of negativity. And so I don't know if that was me, once again, not resolving that issue and just feeling that. I. You know, these are the things that you are left to reflect on. Right. And, and mentally you try to make sense of it to, to right. help you out. And uh, So we're down to five minutes. Okay. I told you the time flies. And, and I want to make sure I cover all this stuff. This stuff is so fascinating to me. So you came back into your body and then you were in the hospital for 13 days yes. ensuing this operation. Mm -hmm. How did you feel during that time? Like, did you feel like a lot of the unresolved stuff like you had with your ex-wife or whatever that you may have been containing within your soul? Did you feel that you let it go after that experience? It took me a while to, to, to let it go, to, to, to make sense of, okay, I survived this. There's reasons why I survived this. And I knew that I had not, I, I was, I'm a, I was always moving forward without resolving what I needed to resolve. So I, I knew I had to do that to have completion of, of being in my, as a person, to have that inner peace I needed to, to work on myself to resolve. You know, and my, do you have that now? I do. You're very peaceful and happy? Very peaceful and happy inner peace. I'm so happy. happy to hear that. Thank you. What would you say to someone watching my show about anger and just about life, because I feel that when you hold on to anger, it affects your entire well-being. Yes. You're oblivious. You're not really aware of how it's affecting you as a person. And as I've grown older, I've learned to let the stuff go and forgive people. And people say to me, why are you so forgiving? Well, I do it mostly for myself, although I don't want to make it sound selfish. I'm doing it for both of us but most, mostly for me. Do you find now that it's easier for you to forgive people? I do, and, and most importantly, myself. And, Good. Because that was the hard one, right, to forgive myself for my past failures and my part in it. And uh, yeah, and I think what I would say to people is, you know, life is a journey, and it is about learning about you. And a lot of times we don't have the knowledge of how to do that, so sometimes, you know, getting in touch with somebody who's been through stuff and asking them how they did it. I t spoke with counselors and also I have a, a wonderful partner now, wife, who a lot of life experiences and, and the tools. And, and you have to 
get real with yourself. And, and that's the first step. And, and, and then from there, that's the beginning. And, and I think, you know, that desire to learn on a, and I think faith comes into play. Yes, you must have Because faith. faith, with the faith, and what that means for me is that God has your back and it will work out. I love that you talk about God because he's done my whole life is about God. I've done so many stupid things, and I know that I will never, ever have to worry about anything because he's always, like you say, got my back. So our time is up. Can you believe it? I don't. That was very quick. I told you. <laughs> before you know it, it's over. So you can, before we wrap real quickly, you feel now that because of that negative experience, you have become a person who is in charge of your life and know yourself. I become a much better person, and 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 I progressed more than I would have if I didn't experience that. I can tell you that, and and I'm a much better spot, and a good spot in my life right now because of it. James, thank you so thank much you for so sharing much. your story with us. It's really inspiring, and I just really hope that anybody who's watching this show, who has fear about death will take something back from what you've brought back. Different people bring different stories and that they will learn to let go of the things that make them angry or that have hurt them to find a way to let it go for their own health and well-being and so that they can live a better life and probably not have a near-death experience because they're living such a healthy life. Thank you so much for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. I always enjoy learning these stories myself as I share them with you and each and every single one of them has inspired me and I hope it's making a difference in the lives of all of my viewers. Thank you to my crew, thank you James, and thanks for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. I'll see you next time.